Good evening. Welcome everyone to today's session on copyrights. Uh, this is hosted by ILA Sonipat chapter. So uh, in just one minute, I'll quickly introduce ILA to all of you. Indian Lawyers Association is the largest organization of all legal professionals in the country. And we help uh, all professionals, uh, budding lawyers, students to come together uh, with, a, with a purpose to share knowledge, network and grow. So we are basically working to create a common voice of all lawyers across India. We primarily work on a model of uh, chapters which bring in local flavor to ILA functions. So I'll hand it over to Ms. Sanya, who is the president of ILA Sonipat chapter. And also I would love to congratulate her on uh, arranging different kind of events on topics beneficial to our community. This event will also be live streamed on ILA Facebook channel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madhura ma'am, for the kind introduction. And uh, as you all know, we are at our nascent stage and we have started having events and we are overwhelmed to have eminent speakers from all over India. And uh, uh, with us today is uh, uh, Mr. Matthews, and uh, he has more than eight years of experience in the field of intellectual property. And uh, he started his career with uh, uh, different law firms and uh, and today he is a managing associate at Intel Advocate. He has also completed his LLM from Queen Mary University of London. So we are really excited to hear his uh, presentation on the topic of copyright. So it, it is he, uh, in today's presentation, he'll talk about the basics of copyright, which I'm very sure would be very beneficial to students who are enthusiasts from the field of intellectual property and specifically copyrights. So over to you, sir. We look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you, Sonia, for your kind words. And uh, Madhura, ma'am, uh, I know you're there as well. So thank you so much for having me over. Uh, the first instance, thank you to ILE for hosting the session and for calling me over as a speaker. Uh, so I've just shared my screen uh, onto, the, uh, onto your screens as well, so you can see this. Uh, so we are, of course, going into, you know, looking into the law of copyrights as such. Uh, and that, that's quite interesting because uh, it's, it's an area of law which has got quite a lot of scope for uh, interpretation and that's what makes it quite interesting. So uh, before we start, I'd like to start off with a statement. And uh, the statement goes something like this. An artistic literary or musical work is the brainchild of the author, the fruit of his labor, and so considered to be his property. So this is quite relevant when we look at the law of copyrights. Now, how is the question? And that's what we're going to analyze or study during this next uh, hour or less than an hour or so. Okay, so let's now see uh, what is copyright. But before we look at what is copyright, let's also understand what is the determination of property. So the concept of property is quite interesting in the sense that property was always uh, determined to be uh, land or cars or houses. So this is what property was in the old sense, you could say. That's what our parents and grandparents looked at when they talked of property. But the concept of property underwent a change wherein anything which is created out of the intellect of a person like you and me is also protected. So that became known as intellectual property. Now, within intellectual property, we have various uh, facets or headings, you could say, which cover various things. So now we're going into that, but before that, also understand why is IP important to us? Intellectual property okay, so protects creations and inventions. It gives you a monopoly, right? It rewards the right of the individual. It leads to continued innovations. There's an assurance of ownership and aids business growth and expansion. So let me give you a couple of examples. I was, uh, so if you have, rather if you're a creator and you create something, you feel you need to get protected. If you're not adequately protected, what happens is that you feel disillusioned if somebody copies it. You feel angry, you feel sad. These are feelings which naturally come up to you and me as a human person because something we created is stolen. Somebody has taken it and said that that is his. This happens even on a day-to-day -day basis if 
you are not given appreciation during uh, at your places of work as well. So protecting that became the core importance of you know intellectual property. It, it became it was required. It was much required, and that is why you have protection of IP. You have this whole facet called intellectual property, which came around. You need to reward the creator. You need to be able to incentivize him and allow him to create again, but without protection, without giving him a monopoly right to monetize, to innovate, he will not do that. He needs that appreciation in the market today. So intellectual property is nothing but you can say protecting that, uh, which is most important to you and me in today's world. Seeing that, like I stated, intellectual property has various different facets or headings, you could call it. So you have trademarks, you have geographical indications, copyrights, patents, and designs. I believe ILA has already done a session on trademarks, so we're not going to go into that. But the subject matter of today's study is copyright. Now, interestingly, copyright is not the right to copy, rather it's the right not to copy. Again, I'm going to go into that. But before that, Yesterday, when I was thinking of you know what to say and making my notes accordingly, I just looked back on my day. And in the evening, when I was going back from work, I was driving in my car, I was listening to music, and I reached my home. I freshened up, I opened the newspaper, a couple of articles I had not read, went over it. A uh, very interesting article on NFTs or non-fungible tokens, which was very, very uh, you know, right in the news today, I you know, went into its, the marketplace to see the, how I could purchase one, looked over it. Uh, and I would listen to some podcasts in that regard. And then I understood something that I seem to be consistently interacting with the law of copyrights. How so? When I was traveling back in the car and I was listening to music, music is a subject matter of copyright law. When I listened to those podcasts on NFT to increase my knowledge, that was copyright. The podcast itself was someone's copyright. The articles in the newspaper that I was reading, that was copyright. And also the NFT was also the copyright of someone. Now, who does that belong to? That's a little bit of a gray area, and I'm not gonna go into that in too much detail, but what I'm trying to state or show is that as individuals today, we are constantly interacting with the law of copyright and we do it unknowingly and subconsciously. We are not conscious that we're interacting with it, but if you actually sit down and think about it, everything that we have in and around us is copyrightable subject matter or mostly copyrightable subject matter. Now, the features of copyright. What you see on your screen is these four headings that I've created for the subject matter of today. But understand that copyright was historically always linked to literary work or written work. In the start, before the invention of the printing press, one could very difficult, with a lot of difficulty, create one piece of work. And that was it. It was very difficult to create a second one because you didn't have the technology for it. The printing press changed everything. With the invention of the printing press, one could now create copies of the work and thus arose the problem of infringement of copying that we you know, legally call today. To combat that, we had law which was created with this copyright law. So like I said, it is a right not to copy. Okay, Copyright does not mean the right to copy, it's a right not to copy. It's called a negative right in legal parlance. A negative right means that if I'm giving you a monopoly right, you have the right to prevent others from uh, exercising a right which has been given to you. So you prevent by give, telling you that you own the copyright of this particular book, you prevent anybody else from writing an identical book. Okay, So that is the kind of right that you are getting. It is an inherent right. And what does you mean by that? Very simply put, from the time of its creation, copyright is already vested in the author of that particular work. One does not explicitly need to file at the copyright registry to gain protection under the law of copyrights. From the time of his creation, one already has uh, protection under this particular piece of uh, law, which is or legislation, which is there in front of us today. And it governs literary, musical, artistic works, audio recordings, and video recordings. Now, I will go into why it is important to seek copyright protection at the copyright registry as well during the course of this 
presentation towards the end because it has got something to do with the enforcement aspect. Like I said, it's a bundle of rights. Copyright has a right to make adaptations, right to reproduce your work, right to issue copies, right to make translations, and right to communicate the work to the public. Pretty straightforward. This is what you get when you say that you are a copyright holder. You get all of these various rights, you get all of these flexibilities and freedoms to do these things and prevent others from doing it as well. So if somebody else you know, creates or reproduces your work, without authorization from you, he has technically committed in legal parlance what we call as infringement. So when you say you get copyright, you get these bundle of monopoly rights, which is granted to you by the government of India by virtue of this document, which is sent to you from the copyright registry, which is called the certificate of registration. Now, going forward, you need to understand who the owner of the copyright is. Now here it's kind of confusing. It's not confusing, but there's a difference from other IT laws. So there is a difference between the owner and the author as per section 17 of the copyright. Owner is pretty straightforward. I'm the owner of something. I have, let's say I have a car. I'm the owner of the car. And when I say that I'm the owner of the car, I'm the guy who, who has the, or rather to whom the car is registered in and it's in whose name the RC is issued. Pretty straightforward. But what does author mean? Because I said there's a difference between author and owner in the law of copyrights. The author in the cop under copyright law is the first creator of that work, you could say. So in a literary work, the author of the book is the actual author, but the owner may be the publishing house. Due to an agreement between the author and the publishing house, such as Eastern Law House or uh, Penguin Publishers or whoever, the publisher becomes the owner of the work, whereas the author is the person who wrote that particular piece of work or commentary or book okay so there is a difference between author and owner in a cinematograph film it is a producer the script may be pre prepared by me um the lyrics may be prepared for a song or prepared by someone else but the producer is the eventual owner of the entire production or the entire movie so we may have let's say ar Rahman who created the music for a particular movie somebody else who created the script but Ram Gopal Verma's production house is the one which kind of produced it. So, or the T-series is the one which produced it. So T-series becomes the owner of that uh, cinematograph film or sound recording. For a photograph, it's pretty straightforward. The author happens to be the person who took that photograph. So if I took a photograph of a wonderful scenery somewhere in Kashmir, I am the owner of that particular photograph. That is why they tell you that if you're going to Google and taking, if you take images from there directly, you might be infringing the copyright of someone. If you put photos on social media, very, very rampant today, you put it up there, you are the own author of it, you're the owner also of it, but uh, Facebook may have certain rights, so you'll have to see the terms of use to determine whether they have any rights of ownership over that particular piece of work. And that is true with every piece of social media out there. We rarely read the terms of use and therefore, we rarely understand who the owner of a particular work is. And we think we are the owners, but sometimes we may have subconsciously or unknowingly turned over our rights in it to that particular platform. In a musical work, the composer is the actual author, where the owner might be someone else. And in an artistic work, the artist might be the, or rather is the author, the person who painted it, but somebody else may be the person who must be, the, maybe the uh, art exhibition or they will be uh, the art exhibition or the art house they might be the actual people of whom might be the owners of that particular work so there is a distinction between author and owner in the law of copyrights so to determine who the right flows from or who's the right holder one has to look at it from this aspect there are of course exceptions to every rule like all of us know every rule has an exception that is built into law and such so too, uh, as such exceptions exist in the law of copyrights. If the literary work is made in the course of the employment of the author by the proprietor, let's say of a newspaper, let's say somebody, let's say there's Times of India as a newspaper, and I was the person who wrote the article, and I'm in the employment of Times of India, Times of India will become the owner of that particular um, article, and not me, due to the fact that I work for them. It's a 
employer employee relationship which exists so today my presentation though it is mine does not belong to me it belongs to my office intel advocate logo which you can see on the bottom right and honor of your screen so it doesn't belong to me it belongs to them okay though i created it i am the author yes but since i am in their employment and i am kind of doing this on behalf of the firm it belongs to them similar with a photograph or a portrait or an engraving you come across various instances in day to day life wherein we give a certain consideration for a photograph to be taken so we say i give you 100 rupees and please you know give us this wonderful photograph and take it and give it to us at that particular point of time you are doing it for a valuable consideration for someone else on the instance of someone else and therefore that person shall become the owner of the copyright he should also be the author of that particular work so you no longer no longer have rights in it except a certain right called moral rights which have not covered here uh mainly because that's a whole different concept in uh you know it, it actually you can actually have a whole different session on moral rights uh as a whole you know so that's the only thing that is not turned over by the original author moral rights so those who want to look into it please do look into it but it's a very very interesting concept but i want which takes extensive time to explain um again the exceptions continue uh work made in the course of an author's employment the contract of service if you are uh, it's a government work so if you're working for the government and you create something you write something it belongs to them uh and also the same in respect of a speech which is created so politicians don't exactly write their speeches as an example there's a speech writer who writes it for them but the speech writer is a guy in the shadows you never see never hear about him you only hear this wonderful orator who comes up on stage and delivers his speech and he is the owner of that particular copyright in respect of that speech because the person the speech writer is in the employment of that particular person and therefore whatever he creates during the course of his employment belongs to that person who employed him which brings us to the next question what is copyright question and i've talked about copyrights i've told you why it's important i've told you the features of it i've told you the difference between author and owner but what does it actually vest in the simplest examples are as follows literary works poems lyrics stories we constantly interact with such things software Now, software is something which is dual in nature it can be the subject matter of copyright or it can be the subject matter of patents if it is a subject matter of copyrights then it is only the software portion of it there is no hardware in combination with it if the subject matter of patent there will be a hardware which is in combination with that particular software so that's just the slight difference in software which you need to understand and matter to matter it will shift between whether it comes into the law of copyright or whether it comes into the law of design uh, of law of uh, patents sorry then there is artistic works very simple paintings drawings sculptures photographs these are all artistic works which we constantly interact with and uh and you know we know about all of them is and it's, it's pretty straightforward that the copyright that is there is a copyright which vests in this particular line of work cinematograph works something that we have all interacted with during the last one and a half years to various ott platforms such as netflix and amazon prime movies tv shows ads videos these are all cinematograph works or can be classified under the broad heading of cinematograph works then we have song sound recording songs and podcasts what i was listening to yesterday uh, dramatic works plays and speeches musical works notations and tunes and the uh, term of most of them is the life of the author plus 60 years now this life of the author plus 60 years seems to be quite a lot of time right but not according to some people recently amitabh bachchan came up or rather made certain comments in the media because his father's works uh, i think they were it was poetry or poems were coming out into the public domain and they were coming out in the public domain because the term had come to an end the life of his father plus 60 years was coming to an end so when it was coming to an end the works were going to come out into the public domain and there would no longer be copyright which would vest in those poems so he stated that he felt that the term of copyright needed to be increased professionally and personally i feel that life of the author plus 60 years is a substantial amount of time the reason is very simple every piece of copyright that we have in the world today 
is the uh, creation of somebody's intellect, somebody's creativity, somebody's personality. But everything is based on something else. So today, if I've written a wonderful article on a particular subject matter, my article is based on me reading numerous other articles of other authors and also maybe uh, taking some or alluding to certain points which they have made. Of course, I would also put a footnote and give them the due credit for those particular lines which I have included in my piece of work as well. But I have based it on all of their works and I've come up with a new analysis of something and created my article. So every form of uh, copyright is based on something else. So if you allow it to be there in perpetuity, like we have in the law of trademarks, you would find that after a while, people will find it hard to create anything. So you have uh, songs, you know, very old songs, which are there, which are now recreated with, you know, with a whole bunch of new music. You have these wonderful remixes of very, very old songs, which are coming out. How is this possible? This is possible because it is possible to create it once it's there in the public domain, right? So, and if that wasn't there, you wouldn't get these new works which are coming out. For us to enjoy new works, for us to enjoy new copyright, we need to allow the protection for the ones which are already there to also come to an end and not be there in perpetuity. So that's why I feel that this time period is more than sufficient for one to monetize one's work to the best of their abilities. How does one file a copyright? It's a very, very simple process, much simpler than even the law of trademarks. There is a copyright application which needs to be filed at the copyright registry. Very simple. You fill in the details and you submit it to the uh, copyright office, which is now based in Dwaraka. It's an extension of the trademark office. It's located in the same building. It wasn't so a couple of years, but a few years back, they shifted to Dwaraka as well. So you have a copyright office based in Dwaraka today in India. Once the copyright application is received by the copyright office, they will review it for objections, if any. If there are any objections, if there's some clarity which they require, there will be an official letter which is issued to you. On receipt of the official letter within 30 days from receipt, one is to submit a written response. Let's say there are no objections, the matter will proceed straight to uh, registration and the copyright registration certificate will be issued. Let's say on the alternative, there is a certain objection which is greater objections which are raised. Then you need to file your written response. If the response is sufficient and the officer feels that his doubts and clarity has been received, then he will allow it to proceed to the issuance of the registration certificates and subsequent registration. However, if he feels that further clarity is required, a hearing or oral hearing may be held in this particular matter, which happens at the copyright registry. Till I would say the five years ago, all this was done uh, through hard copy filings or paper filings. Five to six years ago, there was a shift. The concept of digital India again plays a part here, wherein the copyright office, like the trademark office, also stated that they would now have an online platform where one could file uh, your application digitally online sitting at home today. So today we have a system which is digital in nature. We can file our copyright applications online. The forms are available on the copyright portal. And uh, the best part of it is unlike the trademarks registry, you don't need a digital signature to sign your copyright. So that is something which is slightly different from the uh, trademark or online portal, which is out there. The only difference between both laws is that under the law of copyrights, we are other as per practice, they also require us to send a physical copy by courier to them. Now, this may sound self-defeating to the digital system, but the system which is there today is still in its infancy. You have to understand that it is not a very uh, advanced system. There is still a lot of scope of improvement and they're consistently improving it. They have now opened up a system wherein you can file your responses to these official letters online. So there are improvements which are consistently taking place. They are also trying to up their backend so that one is able to upload the various works as well uh, online. So 
there are definitely measures to improve the digital filing system of the copyright registry. And in a couple of years from now, we're definitely going to see much, much, much more changes which could come about and all for the better. Touch wood. Now, let's say you have your copyright registered. You get a registration certificate from the copyright office. I had initially stated that copyright is an inherent right. One does not need to file expressly at the registry to get protection. From the time of its creation, you already have protection. Now, why is, did I say that? And why do you now need to file for it? You need to file for it because if there's an infringement today, that piece of paper acts as primary evidence to be able to allow you to enforce your rights against another party. Let's say in the absence of that particular document from the copyright registry, the registration certificate maybe, you will then need to prove that you are the owner of that particular copyright before you are able to satisfy that you can enforce that your right against another party. So this piece of document is very, very, very important. And I will show you why as well later on, where we will just skim over certain sections in respect of criminal enforcement, which is there in the Copyright Act as well. Infringement is exactly what the term clearly states. You are infringing or crossing the boundaries of a particular right of somebody else. So infringement means doing an act of the ex exclusive right to do, which is conferred upon the owner of that copyright without a license to do. So, so today, I don't have a license to uh, rewrite P. Narayan's commentary on copyrights. However, if I do so, then I'm infringing his rights. Uh, permitting for profit any place to be used for the communication of work. So I'm allowing my premises to be used for the sale of um, movie CDs. Now this used to happen a lot, especially in Nehru place for those who are conversant with the uh, Delhi MCR markets. Uh, Nehru place and uh, Palika Bazaar were two places where uh, we all used to go to purchase uh, CDs for 20 rupees or 30 rupees of amazing movies like James Bond and so on and so forth. And we were all conducting infringements, I should say. So that was something that we all had our hands in and done, most of us anyways. And uh, we were all infringing someone's copyright. Uh, begging for hire, selling, letting, offering for sale, any infringing copies of her works. So this is pretty self-explanatory. All this amounts to infringement. Simply put, if you do not have the authority to do a particular act and you still do it, you are infringing someone's right. That's so under so infringement again, you have civil remedies and criminal remedies. So civil remedies pretty straightforward. If someone's conducted an infringement, you are free to go forward and initiate a suit in the relevant high court, depending on cause of action and so on and so forth to determine jurisdiction. But interestingly, you also have criminal remedies available under the Copyright Act. So section 63 to 65 of the Copyright Act deals with criminal remedies and there's a punishment also and there's a fine also which is prescribed within it. I've put on the screen the various uh, infringements that could occur and also the subsequent or the corresponding fines and uh, imprisonment terms which are there as well. I won't go into too much detail, but what one needs to understand is the importance of criminal remedies and how we use it on a day-to-day -day practice. During the pandemic, for the longest time, a lot of production of goods was not taking place. So what happened was that we, uh, a lot of products were not being manufactured by the holder of those products, a lot of food products and so on and so forth. The infringers saw an opportunity because when the market slowly started opening up, there was a demand for these products. And being unable, the distributors were unable to give the retailers these products due to the fact that not much of it was, they didn't have stocks, basically. The infringers saw this as a business opportunity, and then they decided to create infringing, or rather they started to create uh, duplicate products and put it on the market, nothing mal basically. And they used to sell it to these retailers. Due to the fact that lawyers like us used to have copyright certificates, we were able to submit uh, those documents along with a written complaint to the relevant police stations. And the police had what is known as a power of search and seizure. 
under section 64. Now under section 64, the police could go into the premises with us on the basis of our complaint, satisfy himself that those infringing products were there. And obviously each of these products had some form of artwork or they had maybe a package design and so on and so forth. So all of them were artistic works and you know we had copyright registrations for them. Based on our paperwork, based on our copyright registration certificates, which we were able to show the police, we were able to successfully search the premises with the help of the police. So they were able to search the premises rather than we were in an assistive role more than likely. And they were able to seize these infringing products as taking them off the market and causing an economic loss to the infringers. What helped us was the fact that we were able to get all these certificates in place well before understanding that we had this particular right which we could enforce with the police against infringers. So that is why having copyright registration certificates is important. Filing for your copyrights, even though it is an inherent right, is of paramount importance as well because you are able to do such kind of actions with the help of these documents. Let's say we did not have those documents then we would have to maybe go under the law of trademarks. But under the law of trademarks, the police has to seek an opinion from the trademarks registry, which could take time to come. And in that intertwining time period, the infringers would ensure that the goods are sold or they are moved. And there could be also an infr uh, information leak as well, which could happen. Infringing goods do not stay on the market for a long period of time. They are there today and they're sold out today like that. That's how the uh, black market works. So having copyright protection over artistic works, your different types of uh, literary works, books, etc. is important. Filing for them is also important because it enables you to have that freedom to enforce your right when required to do so. So again, these are other examples of criminal offenses which are there as specified by the act. And you will find you know, mention of stuff like computer programs and so on and so forth, which have come around. Initially in the Copyright Act, this is not there. They have come around due to the advancements in technology that we have. So like we have the printing press come about and you know copies being made, today we have the internet, we have various problems because of computers, 3D printers, so on and so forth, which we are constantly tackling through uh, the law of copyrights in many a uh, case, uh, depending on a case-to-case uh, -case basis that we look at. So again, uh, more examples of criminal offenses, which I'm not going to go into and bore the audience here. Uh, copyrights, like I stated, is quite interesting. There's quite a lot of scope uh, to interpret it in different, different ways. One is always interacting with the law of copyrights. The interesting question that you, me, and everybody else needs to ask is, are we listening or are we seeing how we are interacting with them? Because we constantly are. Sanya, over to you. And thank you so much for uh, listening to me patiently. Thank you so much, sir, for the enlightening session and the very elaborate uh, uh, slides and the presentation that you showed. The floor is now open for the participants uh, to address any questions uh, they have uh, and also to interact with the speaker. Uh, you can unmute yourself or you can also type out your questions in the chat box. Hi, Matthew, sir. I'm on this side. Hi, Aman. Good evening. Good evening, sir. So, so I have a question regarding fair use of copyright. If, okay. uh, so, sir, so, uh, like you mentioned that there was some heavy regarding uh, the availability of uh, Mr. Bachchan's father. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to understand even if the copyright existed in, in his work, so on what grounds can somebody use it under the ambit of parody? Ah, so, okay. So there is the concept of fair use, which act as defenses to infringement, which is there as mentioned in section 52, if I'm not mistaken, of the Copyright Act. Now, I mean, um, 
parodies are, you could say, sarcastic or humor-based takes on various things. And they need to be looked at in that light. What one needs to be very careful in respect of parodies is that one should not uh, cross over the spectrum of or into moral rights because you do, or rather you cannot create a parody in such a way that it, in, or rather it goes against the moral rights of the author in the first instance. So to give you an example, if I was to take any of these poems and use it, let's say for a pornographic movie today, that would be against uh, a, the basic law of copyright, and two, it would also go against the moral rights of the author today. Now, in the absence of, or rather if the author is, is dead, obviously the right holder holds his rights at that particular point of time. Okay, so parodies are allowed, that is fair use, but one needs to be careful uh, what you are, or rather what your parody is based on, or rather not based on, but how your parody is going to be looked at. So just be careful of that when you're doing parodies. Yes, sir. So as you said that it, uh, it will depend on the use of the copyrighted material as to right. how it is used. And on based on that use, the parody has to be interpreted by the courts. Right. So, um, I mean, it's a, what do you call it? it it's, so parody is only a spoof. Okay. So if your spoof is just, you know, a joke, uh, nothing more, nothing less, uh, a sarcastic joke, obviously. And it, that's it. And you're not infringing the moral rights of the author. I think you will be fine. You should be fine. I mean, people could take offense to it. Uh, I mean, I see a lot of people take offense to a lot of things just on the basis of very, very small things. But the offense, obviously, it would be, it, it, and a law is not based on the, just on the emotions of one person or two people. It's also based on a lot of other fundamental things. And I think that will be the scale on which it is judged on. Whether the parody would fall under fair use under Section 52 and the exceptions fall with. All right, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aman, for your question and thanks, sir, for attending the question. Uh, does anyone else have any question? You can type it out in the chat box or just feel free to unmute yourself. In the meanwhile, sir, I have a question. Uh, so in today's time, when we uh, are seeing uh, use of increased use of social media, specifically Instagram, Reels, TikTok, everything. So uh, it, there is an increase in difficulty in uh, the copyright in, in deciding the copyright issues. For example, a person may claim that this meme was created by me. The other person could claim, well, the idea was mine, and so on and so forth. So, uh, uh, what what are your views in this regard? So, do you think there could be a possible solution to this if there is a copyright infringement case initiated by one or the other influencer on Instagram or TikTok? Yeah, so for, firstly, social media has not been coming to the law of copyrights. Uh, rather, it has been, uh, you could call it, it, it's opened up a whole new Pandora's box as far as infringements are concerned. Uh, today, due to, you know, maybe a lack of knowledge or understanding, all of us in one way or other do conduct copyright infringements. I mean, there is nobody who says today that I have not copied an image of Google and put it on my presentation. No. I mean, there are websites where you can pay for images and get it, but how many of us have done it? Okay. We live in that kind of a world. And into that world, we have memes, we have TikToks, we have reels, and we have a whole host of things, some of which even I don't know the names of today. Okay. Proving uh, whether who the copyright holder in that is a very, very tough task as well. That is why if you have a copyright today, it might just be better to get it registered because you have at least that document from the government of India stating that you are the copyright holder of it. You know, obviously you have to satisfy the various requirements of a copyright, but at least you have that in your hands. So when, when we opened up our lives through social media uh, and put up images, put up photos, you know, put up uh, articles that we wrote as well, um, we have also opened up ourselves to infringement, which can occur. 
So there are people today who use images of famous personalities as well. Uh, I mean, there's now here there is a slight uh, crossing over between trademark rights and copyrights, but you know certain images can be used as uh, copyrights as well. So I could use the image of uh, let's say James Bond for um, selling pan masala or whatever, okay, without authorization. But because I have utilized it without authorization, I am conducting infringement. Okay, the the uh, caricature of James Bond which is used that could be copyrightable. Uh, just that person standing with you know gun you know zero zero seven running across, so that's copyrightable. Uh, but the, actually, if I use maybe let's say that Daniel Craig, Daniel Craig's or Pierce Brosnan's image onto that, then I would be conducting maybe trademark infringement. Okay, so so uh, we have opened ourselves up to a whole host of these infringements which are going to occur, and they're not going to stop. You know, they're not going to stop. Uh, technology, media, you know, social media out there, and we can't stop it. We can only ensure that if you find something, we ensure that it's taken off. Even today on marketplaces such as Amazon, we have infringements which are taking place in the sphere of copyright. So I may be representing a famous coffee maker and I would have 20 people selling the same type of coffee on Amazon who are not authorized to sell it. So I have to take it down. I have to, you know, if, if my artwork is being copied, then it is artistic work, which is copyrightable and I file to take it down and take down those links. But I take down 100 links, 100 new ones crop up. So there is no short shot solution to ensuring that there's no infringement online. This is going to happen. Okay. This is going to consistently happen. And the only thing that we can do as right holders is to ensure that we don't put up important works uh, subconsciously just out there uh, you know, without thinking twice about it. So if let's say you have written a wonderful article, Sanya, and you want to get it published somewhere, just try down that route, get it published in a particular place rather than, you know, putting it up and, and then somebody seeing it and then copying the entire gist of it, you know, and then you having to run around saying it's my article, it's my article. So we have to also take safeguards or a self-regulation to ensure that we don't, uh, unnecessarily put stuff out there, which is important to us. I mean, we, we do put everything out there nowadays, but just try to be careful, uh, you know, amongst ourselves itself. Uh, I had a follow-up, sir. So as you told, so we should refrain from putting out our uh, literary works, for example, articles, etc., which we think are important to us and might get copied. So, uh, but imagine if we put out a piece of work, a sh very short piece of work, maybe just as a story on Instagram and people take a screenshot and without acknowledging, put it up on their story and get a lot of followers claiming that it's their own work or even if they don't claim people assume that okay it's their work and they get start getting followers and then i feel infringed and i feel infringed because i would have gotten those followers and now that person is getting and i can i just claim a uh, an infringement case against him or her? if a substantial copy of your work has been copied then why not okay if a substantial amount of work of yours has been copied Taken point, uh, there was when J.K. Rowling created a book called Harry Potter. Somebody created an encyclopedia of Harry Potter characters. So somebody actually took all the characters, provided pages and pages of summary. There is a substantial amount of work which did go in. However, the court ruled against that particular party and said that J.K. Rowling had rights and this person was infringing that person's work, uh, rather Rowling's work. The reason why that was done was that substantial portion, rather the encyclopedia as a whole, was fully filled with characters which J.K. Rowling had created. So all that the person who created the encyclopedia had done was to put it all together to collate the information and to create the summaries for each of them. That was it. But the characters were taken from her book, her work, her creativity. So substantial amount was copied, was what the now, this is, I think, uh, this is a UK-based judgment. This is not an Indian, it's a UK-based judgment, but this is what went down. I mean, it could be said that, uh, that there are pros and cons for that particular judgment. There are two schools of thought. Some say that that judgment itself is erroneous. I mean, uh, because the encyclopedia is, compiling an encyclopedia is not easy. And there was a substantial amount of work which went in. But 
the court ruled against it. So like you say, if somebody took a screenshot of your reel or whatever, and then create something new, then if a substantial amount has been copied and it's a very important facet which has been copied, then yes, you do have uh, the right to take action against those particular parties. Whether you are going to be successful or not, that is something which would be you know, decided by the relevant authorities at that particular point of time on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, sure, so, and that also reminds me of the difference between the two doctrines and the, the tussle that you talked about, the sweat of brow versus the spark of creativity, yeah. as in regarding the encyclopedia specifically. Thanks a lot for that answer, sir. Uh, we have a question yeah. from Shreya. Uh, yes, Aman, uh, do you have a point? I'm sorry. Yes, yes. In furtherance of your question, sir, I have a little doubt. Sir, don't you think even if the reels or anything posted on social media is copied, that the commercial exploitation aspect has to be taken into consideration? Because unless and until the substantial element of a copyright has been copied, and it, it, it has been just for, uh, like, if I say that it has been for any kind of fair use. Right. So don't you think that the commercial uh, exploitation aspects uh, also come into play? And I'm not uh, concerned about the moral rights. Yeah, as so it, it will come into play. Uh, and you basically have to look at it from all aspects of the case. So you, you need to see what commercial aspect were there, were there any, if, 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 if so, what was it, what, what did it amount to? Because if you're going to file a suit, then obviously you want to claim damages for it. And if you're going to claim damages for it, how do you compute it? So there are going to be aspects need to be looked at when you are going forward claiming rights against another party. Okay, it's, that's why I said copyright law at the start when I said it, it's quite interesting because it's not uh, straightforward as one looks at it. I mean, each case is different. Uh, each incident is different. So this you can't basically say Aman's read was copied, so he got rights, he was able to enforce it. Sanya was not able to enforce it, why not? I mean, there, there are a lot of small little factors which factor in which kind of change everything. Uh, Aman, I'll give you an example. Movies, okay? Yes. Uh, English, so a lot of, uh, and you, you could basically tell me more than I could tell you. Uh, the <laughs> Hindi movies which are basically copies of English movies. Okay? Yes. I don't know each of the titles, but I do know there are a lot of copies. Now, how do these Hindi movies exist? I mean, they, nobody sued them, right? Nobody sued them, they're in, they're in existence. And since we have viewed the English movie, we know that the, the Hindi version is the storyline is exactly the same, except towards the end, you know, they change a little bit. Okay. How do they exist? They exist very simply put because uh, there is a change in the language, there is a change in the background scenery, there's a change in the actors, the dress, the underlying score of and a whole host of other things, and you have a slight tweaking of the storyline. Copyright also says. You don't get copyright protection in an idea. You only get it in the expression of an idea. I see that that's something that I should have. Said. You only get it in the expression of an idea. So if the expression of the idea is different, that person will say, I now have copyrights in this particular piece of work. I mean, you have copyright in your work, I have copyright in mine. Okay. We also see this uh, very rampant in the gaming industry. So a lot of these new games which came out, all of them just have a character running, collecting coins or trucks or whatnot. You know, I think Pokemon is one of those games. If I'm not mistaken. I, I could be wrong, but yeah, I think Pokemon is one of those games. So you all just have these people running across railway tracks or mountains and whatnot. The idea of the game is pretty much the same. Collect these coins, keep running. You know, but the expression of it is different. So you have various types of games such as this. Uh, I think Call of Duty and uh, what's the Indian version of it is an Indian version of Call of Duty. So that, that's another one which exists side by side. The idea is pretty much the same, but the expression is different. So you could find different expressions of an idea, which basically may make the copyright different. You need to look at all the aspects of it before you enter into enforcement of your rights against another party. You may feel that someone has stolen something which they did not have a right to. Agreed. But you know, when you're going in for a dispute, you need to look at all the aspects, including the commercial angle, which you rightly mentioned. Right, sir. Thank you. But apart from everything, sir, I am so poor at games, so I cannot suggest <laughs> you anything. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, so uh, I think Sanya Shreya had a question. Punish copyright, yeah. just be a fine or an Uh Both. 
and or all. So it could be uh, a fine or it could be imprisonment as well. So the issue of the uh, so section 63 to section 65, you will find the options which are given for both a fine and an imprisonment, depending on whether it's a first offense or you're committing a second time and so on and so forth. So depending on, a, on the case, the uh, authorities can decide what to you know, grant out. So maybe if you want to give somebody a rap on their knuckles, maybe it could be a fine. But if they still don't learn the lesson, maybe there'll be, there'll be imprisonment which follows right after that. So it depends on a case-to-case -case basis, but the options are given within the Copyright Act itself for either of these to happen or both. Thank you so much, sir, for addressing that question. I just have a last question from my sure. end. Uh, so imagine if the uh, the person who could um, claim the infringement uh, um, on a particular uh, copying of, a, say, work or maybe on something that they said is no more in this world. For example, a quote by Rooney. Um, or maybe a quote by Mahatma Gandhi, and it's uh, and it's presented wrongly, as is done by many people on social media these days. So they just copy someone's uh, quotation and paste someone else's name with their picture uh, to make a meme out of it. Uh, so who would be uh, can can anyone bring in a suit of infringement? Can any person or who who would bring a suit? Right. So um, each of these people who passed away have heirs to whom uh, the next of kin, you can say, those people can bring rights, or rather can enforce their father's rights against the thing. So let's let's go back to the Ramita Bachchan example. Okay. Uh, let's say uh, somebody, rather during the term of the copyright, somebody infringed the poem and somebody, you know, copied it. Okay. Ramita Bachchan could bring a suit against that particular party. Because as the heir, all the property of his uh, father has passed on to him. He's the owner, not the owner, but the, you could say that you call him like a trustee of it. You know, he didn't create it, but he is not the trustee of it. So everything uh, today in the world, today, the, the, the concept of heirs is there, the next of kin is there. So they would be able to enforce their rights in, in the event of the uh, death of that right holder, that particular point of time. So you find a lot of these instances where uh, especially in the music industry, wherein after the death of these artists, their work is infringed. Okay, so uh, that is quite rampant, I guess, in the music industry and to a large extent, even in the movie industry, if I'm not mistaken. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, if anyone has any question, I guess there are no more questions. And uh, in that case, we could uh, call it a day. Uh, I don't think anyone has any questions. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much, sir, for, for this uh, enlightening session on copyright. And we are very grateful to have you for our online event on ILS Sonipat. And we look forward to have you for further events in the future as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sam. Have a good evening to all. Thank you, sir.